Hello again, and welcome to Conversations with Amy Berger. This is a brand new series with Amy Berger, brought to you by Adapt Your Life. And today we're going to be chatting about insulin, insulin resistance and stalls. How are things going, Amy? Uh, going, going well here in North Carolina. How about you? Very good. Are you also having a, 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 a freezing cold spell that's kind of gripping? We are having America. a very cold snap for this part of the country. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, see it's, uh, I see Texas is having a, a closing, shutting down everything in Texas at the moment. Yeah, it's not, not quite that bad here. It's not snowy here, but it's been uh, cold and rainy for several days. Well, let's move on to our first question that I have for you. So um, the first question I have is, how would someone even know that they have insulin resistance? Right. So I'll, I'll take a step back and... Def well, it's, it's hard to define insulin resistance, something that uh, Dr. Westman and I mentioned in the book we wrote together called End Your Car Confusion, is that we don't like the phrase insulin resistance, because if you ask 10 different doctors or healthcare professionals for a definition, you'll get 10 different definitions. Um, I much prefer the phrase chronic hyperinsulinemia, which hyperinsulinemia is just a big word that means your insulin level is too high too much of the time. Chronic meaning, you know, sort of all the time or ongoing, hyper high insulinemia, insulin in the blood. And so if you call it chronic hyperinsulinemia, the, the definition is built right into the phrase, oh, my insulin is too high too often. So then the solution or many potential solutions kind of become self-evident. I need to lower my insulin. And there's a lot of ways to do that. But with regard to determining if you have insulin resistance or chronic hyperinsulinemia, you can get your insulin level tested just like you can get your blood glucose tested, you know, at a, at a regular lab test or a checkup, they can test your insulin. And the, there's a couple of problems with that though. And, and the, the two real quick ones are that just like your fasting blood glucose, there are many people in whom the fasting level is normal but if they eat a meal, especially a meal that's high in carbohydrates, the blood sugar and the insulin will skyrocket. And you won't see how high that is if you only test the fasting level. So sometimes that can be misleading. And then there are, you know, fasting levels of anything are a little bit volatile. In going the other direction, sometimes a fasting insulin can be a little higher than you would expect, but it doesn't automatically indicate there's a problem. So um, without testing at all, without measuring anything, things to look out for that can clue you in that you might have a problem with chronically high insulin include any of the things that we define metabolic syndrome by. Me metabolic syndrome has five official points of diagnostic criteria. And it's um, an elevated fasting blood sugar, large waist circumference. So if you're large around the middle, high triglycerides, low HDL and high blood pressure. So if you have any of those and you kind of can't really explain any other reason why you might have high insulin, people that have high uric acid or who have gout, there are some doctors that think high uric acid should be added to that diagnostic criteria. And other things apart from all of that, women who have PCOS, chronically high insulin is the cause of PCOS. And I, I think we may have mentioned that in a previous video that I don't use that word lightly. That is from the scientific literature and they don't use that word lightly to say that something is the cause of something rather than it's associated with or it's seen in conjunction with. They have said that chronically high insulin is the cause of PCOS. Um, also, if you have a lot of skin tags, um, there's a skin condition where the folds of your skin, so like in the elbow, in the neck, if you have folds, the back of the knees, the knuckles, if that skin looks gray or ashy or black, it's, um, it's a condition called acanthosis nigricans or nigricans, and that's chronically high insulin. Um, there's, there's just a lot of people that have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease that often goes hand in hand with the high insulin. So even without measuring the insulin at all, uh, you, you can kind of be tipped off to the fact that this is a problem. And um, there are, there are 
other ways to test for it. You know, when we do that oral glucose tolerance test and you just drink glucose and they measure your blood glucose at intervals up to two hours, there's a test where you do the same thing, but instead of only testing your blood glucose, they will test the insulin. Cause this is, um, I, I don't wanna go on too much longer about this one point, but there are millions of people who have a normal blood sugar, but the sugar is only normal because very, very high insulin is keeping that blood sugar controlled. And you don't know that unless you actually measure the insulin. So when they do one of these glucose tolerance tests and they measure both, they can see, oh my gosh, if we had only measured glucose, this person looks totally healthy. There's no sign of diabetes whatsoever. But now we measure the insulin and we can see that there's a major problem. Now, with regard to that last test that you just mentioned, I believe that's called the Kraft test. Is that correct? It is. Yeah. It's named after um, Dr. Joseph Kraft, who basically pioneered the use of that test. Now, one of the things that they look out for is um, obviously if you, if you consume a large amount of glucose and then you, you're going to be testing over a two hour period, they want to see how quickly the, the insulin goes up and how quickly the insulin comes back down, because that tells a story as well. Yeah. I mean, how, how sensitive are you to it? Meaning how, how much insulin does your body require to bring that glucose back down to normal and how quickly does it happen? And this is one of, one of the things we actually see in people with hypoglycemia, meaning low blood sugar, they, they start out with a normal level. They eat or drink something very high in carbs, especially refined carbs. And the blood sugar might not go up that much, but the insulin really, really goes high. And then it comes down very quickly. And that very quick drop, or, or even if the insulin doesn't come down, the insulin stays high and the blood sugar tanks. And that's when they get that feeling of, of shakiness and panic and um, wooziness and hunger and the heart starts to race. All those things we associate with hypoglycemia it's, it's not even so much the blood glucose as it is what the insulin is doing to the blood sugar. Now, in your opinion, is the keto diet the best antidote for insulin resistance or um, chronic hyperinsulinemia, as you would prefer to say? In my opinion, yes, it is. But um, there's a lot of researchers and doctors that would say that fat loss is the best way and whatever way you can achieve that would be the solution because the insulin resistance tends to come because of a buildup of fat in the liver and in the pancreas in and around the organs primarily responsible for regulating blood sugar and that's i i'm reminded of a point that i should have made earlier when we talk about this chronically high insulin or insulin resistance this can happen in people at any body weight. This is not something that only happens to people that are overweight or have obesity. You can be at a quote unquote normal weight and have all of these same problems because it's not about carrying a certain amount of body fat. It's where that body fat is and what the effect of that is. So you can be very sort of lean looking on the outside, but have a lot of fat built up in and around these organs. And I, I do think that ketogenic diets are the most effective for improving that, for improving that visceral fat, for getting that fat out of those organs. Um, I also think the, the, because of how well it controls blood sugar and insulin, it helps control hunger and appetite that keto is, in, in, again, in my opinion, the most effective way and the most enjoyable way that you get to really eat a lot of foods that are most other ways of eating are kind of off limits. Um, so I think keto is the most effective, but it's not, it's not the only effective way to do it. Okay. Now, um, in keeping with the topic, insulin resistance or chronic hyperinsulinemia and stalls, is it possible for someone who has implemented the keto diet according to Dr. Westman's ADAPT protocols to stall? Yes. Um, <laughs> and it's, it could be for any number of reasons, you know, they could be they could be eating too much. We, we hate the C word, I, calories, I hate the C word, but we can't ignore the fact that food coming in has to be dealt with. It's, it's energy, it's food energy, it's calories. And that's, you know, calories, a unit of energy. And if you are taking in too much energy from the outside, 
then your body doesn't need to use some of its stored energy, all of this energy that we store on our bellies and hips and thighs and backsides. So that's one reason. Um, other reasons are, it, it may not be a stall, it's just in some people with very severe long-standing health problems. Sometimes it just takes a long time for keto to sort of kick in, in terms of weight loss. Some people will see a lot of other changes that will show them that keto is having a beneficial effect, even if they're stalled, even if the weight loss isn't moving, like they might see the triglycerides come down a lot. They might see, um, they might feel more energy, heartburn might go away. Um, the HDL might come up. They've actually done some studies where they provided the participants food and it was specifically designed to give them enough calories so that they don't lose weight. These people do not lose weight or maybe they lost like one kilo or just a couple of pounds and yet they would reverse metabolic syndrome which basically is insulin resistance. They reversed it even though their weight was almost the same. All of those biomarkers, all of the measurements were improved so much that they would not have been diagnosed with the insulin resistance. And that's what you would call a non-scale victory, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So does the level of insulin resistance play a role in uh, weight or in a weight or fat loss store? So the level of insulin I think it does. I think the more, the, the more severe your issue, the longer it's going to take for something to happen. Um, I think people really have to go into this with realistic expectations that a lot, like we were saying before, you can't, you can't compare yourself or maybe this was in a previous uh, conversation that we did. You can't compare yourself to anyone else's rate of weight loss because your medical history, your dietary history, your current biological situation might be really different. And um, you know, some, I don't know if there's any way to predict how quickly people lose weight or how quickly insulin resistance resolves because some people who have morbid obesity, type two diabetes on all kinds of drugs will lose weight and, and, and have massive improvements almost immediately, like in, in a shocking amount of time, their blood sugar can normalize, they can lose you know, a, a large amount of weight and other people they're doing, they're doing everything right. There's, there's nothing that they need to change. They're honestly really following the plan and it's just slower. And it, sometimes it's just slower. I, I wish there was a magical answer for it. Sometimes it's just slower. Now I've got one more question for you that I wanted to ask. If somebody has metabolic syndrome or chronic hyperinsulinemia or insulin resistance, and they came to you, um, what is the, give, give me the, the, the top two or three things that you would tell them to do. Well, if they know that they have this, um, if they're not already doing a low carb or ketogenic diet, that would be my advice. I mean, I, if you, if you know that the problem is chronically high insulin, then the, the thing that we need to do is bring your insulin level down. And the most powerful way to do that is to just fast, but we don't, we don't recommend that. We don't recommend long-term extended fasting. We'd like for people to eat and nourish their bodies. So um, stick to foods that have the lowest impact on the blood sugar and insulin. And that's gonna be, for most people, that's gonna be refined carbohydrate, especially liquid, car like, like sugar sweetened sodas, fruit juice. We don't, we don't wanna be you know, swallowing liquid food. Um, and for some people, when you have a severe metabolic problem, even the sort of wholesome carbohydrates, even the carbohydrate foods that we would normally consider a perfectly healthy food, even those have to be restricted just to make sure that that insulin is going to be, you know, low most of the time. Because if, if in, insulin kind of gets in the way of fat burning, so if you want to lose weight, if you get rid of body fat, including some of the fat that's building up in the liver and pancreas, we've got to get insulin out of the way. And the way to do that is to stick to foods that affect insulin the least, and that's going to be fat and protein. And um, fasting, fasting is not required, even intermittent fasting, skipping a meal here and there, or having a compressed eating window, you know, eating for just a certain number of hours of the day, and then going the rest of the day without eating, that's not required, but it can be helpful, especially 
if somebody is prone to chronic overeating or just kind of grazing all throughout the day, picking things that can help a little bit because if your body is exquisitely sensitive, and even if you just kind of eat anything, you're going to have a little bit of a reaction, then you might benefit from going some extra length of time during the day without eating. And you, you know, you can have coffee and tea and things like that, but, um, that just helps your body have a little bit more time in a period where you know your insulin is going to be low and you'll be running on fat. Um, that's, that's two things, three things. That would be it. I mean, exercise, exercise is a little controversial here because exercise is not a fat loss tool. It, it really doesn't help many of us lose body fat. And I think most of us learned that the hard way by spending years and years you know, slogging away on a treadmill or an elliptical machine only to see no change whatsoever in our physique or our weight. But I do think that exercise can help improve insulin sensitivity. The more muscle mass you have and the more you use it, think of muscles as little sponges for glucose. So if your muscles are hungry for fuel, they're just gonna gobble it up right away and you don't need a whole lot of insulin to deal with that fuel. Your muscles are just gonna take it regardless. So I do think um, if you, if, if your weight or your mobility or your health situation right now is you can't exercise, that's okay. Keto, the beauty of keto is that it works without exercise for fat loss. Dr. Westman did a video a while back with a patient who was wheelchair bound, who lost 50 pounds on keto with no exercise. And so you don't have to exercise, but if you can, I do think that's another little, um, another arrow in the quiver, so to speak, of, of trying to help your body require less insulin to do its, do its job. Amy, you've given us absolutely amazing pearls of wisdom here. I love your analogies that you've used. Thank you so, so much. That's all we have for today. Uh, now, folks, don't forget to get your bonus. So go grab Amy Berger's free copy of Eight Reasons not to trust the scale. And we'll put a link for you in the description. If you'd like to learn more about Adapt Your Life Academy uh, and our upcoming courses, as we mentioned, uh, or we've mentioned before, Amy Berger has a new course that's coming out in March. So if you go on to adaptyourlifeacademy.com, you'll be able to learn a little bit more about it. And if you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see future videos, you can find us on our YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter accounts under the name of Adapt Your Life. Uh, that's all we have for today, folks. Thank you so much. Amy, thank you so much. And yeah, until next week, we look forward to chatting with you one more time. Thank you so much.